Today we're going to be talking about the topic of coaching ethics. We talked about the theory of coaching ethics last time, but this time what we're going to do is we're going to be going through the American Association of Christian Counselors Code of Ethics. This is the particular book and what it looks like. And the reason we're going through that particular one is that one applies the most to us because we're Christian counselors, because we're biblical counselors, and therefore that's the closest code of ethics to what we're doing. And they say that the foundation of this particular thing, uh, they give us a number of foundation things, but they make the statement here, and this code of ethics was developed in 1998. It's a voluntary, when written, but eventually they were talking about using it for credentialing and membership. Uh, they haven't really done that as far as I know. Well, you can be a member of the American Association of Christian Counselors and you don't have to accept this code. Now, how does that apply to you? Well, it applies to you that if something came up like a malpractice suit or something or other, or somebody was challenging you, they could say, well, this is the code of your profession, these are the standards, and you violated this and this and this. Well, in this particular case, since it's Voluntary, you could say, well, yeah, I know what the code is, but I never really agreed to that. So, words, we're not absolutely binding. These are the ideas of the AACC and how they look at things. Now, how do they compare to other codes of ethics? Well, we have stuff in some other codes of ethics that we definitely don't want to agree to. You have to be careful uh, with that. And there's always pressure because there's political things in a lot of different organizations. Like one of the huge areas... Uh, probably in the American Psychological Association, American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy, and so on, they tend to side with gay marriage, they tend to side with ab uh, abortion rights, they tend to side with uh, areas that we wouldn't agree to. They also are sometimes much more stringent in certain areas that don't fit very well with uh, Christian counseling in the church. So we're going to look at those and see those as we go through this particular code. And then briefly we'll also go over our code of ethics, our Bible-based code of ethics that we've developed here for uh, Christian coaching. So let's take a look at that. At the beginning of the AACC uh, code of ethics, they say it's based on certain biblical ethical foundations. And we're not going to see this in the other groups like uh, uh, American Psychological Association, and so on and so forth. First, Jesus is our model of counseling. There is an essential relationship with the church. Respect for biblical revelation on life, priesthood, and family. Dedicated to excellence in client service, integration, and practice, and respect for others. Now, all of them would have that. Spirit-led integration of spiritual, psychological, social, physical, environmental intervention. Obviously, the secular ones would not have the spiritual part of that. Or if they did, they'd be referring more to new age and other things like that. Biblical and constitutional rights of religious freedom protects the identity and the spiritual practices in counseling. A lot of other organizations would say, no, the only thing we really accept are... Uh, uh, research-based findings. You see what I'm saying? Instead of saying spiritual and uh, uh, Christian type of practices. And that we're representatives of Christ and His church honoring commitments and obligations and all social and professional obligations. They would obviously say we want to be ethical in all the stuff we do. We don't want to hurt people and so on and so forth like we talked about. And the way they break out their code is they have their different sections. If we're going to look at it section by section. And what I'm going to do is sort of synthesize down what they say in the book. I'm not going to use their same words. I'm going to just have a one bullet line for each one of the things that they say. And if it's significant, we need to talk about it. Then we'll talk about it and discuss it. The first one is, remember from last session, we talked about do no harm. Avoid all manner of harm in client congregational relations and recognize the power of differential. We talked about power of differential last time. Remember, as the first thing, the first sign that you're getting into an ethical violation, if you deny that there's a power of differential between the counselor and the client. 
And notice it also says congregational relationships. That's added here. You wouldn't see that in the second type of thing, but we have it here. Resolve client conflicts in the interest of the client, referring if necessary. The idea of it, see, this is all basically, we're not going to do them any harm. Who's secondary in this relationship? We are. We're the one that is supposed to be helping them. Protect the clients from other practitioners' abuse. Work to correct any unethical entanglements with managed care. That's sort of interesting. They're saying it's our responsibility as a counselor when the whole thing gets messed up. Usually what this amounts to is that you write up the appeals. And when the insurance company doesn't want to pay, then you try to defend them and you try to get the insurance company to pay for them. Refusal to participate, advocate, or assist clients to do harm. That's an interesting one. What it's saying is, although we have to accept what the client does, the Bible tells us that we are not to be participants in another person's sin, right? So what does that mean? If you give your client the alternatives and they evaluate the alternatives and they decide they want to be a stripper anyway, what do you say? Well, I'm sorry, I don't believe that that's biblical. I think that's going to destroy you and be very damaged, but I'm not going to go down there and find you a job. I'm not going to be involved in that kind of thing. You make your choices. Hey, you get your consequences. If you come back later on, you want me to patch you up and love you, I'll still patch you up and love you, but I'm not going to participate in that. I'm not going to help you do the thing that is wrong. I'm not going to help you beat up your wife. I'm not going to give you a strategy of how to rob the bank so we don't participate in another person's sins. Refusal to advocate abortion and provide alternatives. Now uh, that we're not going to stand. There was actually a lawsuit of a pastor, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's a counselor, out in California who basically told their client abortion is wrong and they sued him based on one of the other ethical codes which says you're not supposed to say what's right and wrong, you're supposed to help them think out their process, and so on, and not take that kind of stance. Obviously, this ethical code doesn't take that position. Refuse to participate in or advocate euthanasia or assisted suicide, but may support the wish to end the use of artificial means to support life. Some counselors are going to say, well, let me tell you, doctor, you really feel you want to kill yourself? We're saying these things are against the Bible, so therefore in our ethical code, we're going to say we don't do this stuff. So if you did, you'd be violating the ethical code. One of the things I don't see in here that we use in our own counseling center, and be beyond this ethical code, is that we do not advocate divorce. We'll advocate that people do what they can to save their marriage, and they set good boundaries, and the other person chooses a divorce, then that's their problem. And I'm saying so we don't advocate for divorce either. Here that's not listed in this particular code. Sexual misconduct is forbidden. Romantic, sexual, erotic, seductive behaviors, and so on. One of the things it does not say in this code that other codes do tend to say is they say, and we'll see this more when we talk about dual relationships later on, is that other codes will say, uh, if you've been counseling somebody and then you don't counsel them for so many years, then you could have a romantic relationship with them. We find in the ACC Ethical Code there is no time limit for that. All sexual relationships uh, with former clients are forbidden, period. There's no time limit. You can't just, because what's happened in the past is what people do. Well, I think I'm really interested. Let's break off counseling for two years and then we can date. Do not counsel formal sexual partners or marital partners. Dual relationships and multiple relationships. In this code, they suggest that some of those can be ethical. But it's on your part to prove that they're ethical. Ethical means what? It's not going to hurt the other person. Why would this code tend to take that direction? How about in churches? Do we have any problems with dual relationships in churches? Like being the pastor and the counselor? Like uh, counseling people that you sort of at least know something about? You may not be their best friend? Justification of dual relationships is required, providing no harm and informed consent. They're saying, okay, 
There might be some cases, but you're the one that has to justify why this dual relationship is better for the client than if we don't have it. Why is it better if I'm the one who counsels this person, even though uh, they're an equal ministry head with me in the church? And how can I protect that and make, make sure that that is ethical? And of course, with informed consent, the other person realizes the, possi the possibilities here. So this ethical code is definitely not as strong on dual relationships. And I believe that's because it was written by Christians and they realize the problems that we have in churches. Where some uh, codes are so strict, as an example, my daughter uh, gained her degree in psychology. Uh, they, the ethical code is so strong on uh, dual relationships that if they meet somebody in the grocery store, they want to, that's one of the client, they want to say hello to them. We don't believe it has to be that strong. You see what I'm saying? But of course they're teaching students. Sexual and romantic relationships, close family members and friends, employees and supervisors, uh, counseling should be avoided. Other family members and friends, fraternal groups, clubs, and organizational members must be justified. Partnerships, employment, business relationships must be avoided. Customer relationships and barter must be justified. See, some other codes say you can't barter. Why? Because it's a question of how much it's worth. But the idea is all of these things we're saying here in this code is that you have to have a good argument and you probably ought to talk it over with your supervisor and talk it over with other counselors to make sure you're not just warping the situation and justifying yourself to do something that really isn't in the benefit. But the bottom line is what? Do no harm. Notice it also says here, do not counsel church members with whom you have close personal relations, business, or shared ministry relationships. Dual relationships with other church members must be justified. Well, how much do we have to do if you're the church counselor? You know, a lot of justifying of a lot of uh, people that you're counseling. Do not terminate counseling in order to engage in a dual relationship. Okay, that's the area of do no harm. Next part is competence in Christian counseling. Make sure you're competent and you make realistic claims. Refer or consult when outside of competency feels stuck or you're making no progress. Maintain continuous education. Although, see, we don't have any requirements like we do in the state license council. We have to do so many CEUs every two years and things like that. Maintain integrity in work reports and relationships. Seek help for personal problems and refrain from activities that will harm clients until resolved. So if you're struggling with a particular area, they're saying here, uh, you need to stay out of that area with your clients if it could harm them. Or you, and you need to get help for whatever it is because you're the example. Then inform consent in Christian counseling. This is uh, uh, ES1-300. Uh, Securing informed consent for counseling, videotaping, supervision, consulting, and special procedures. Do the written consent structure and process for counseling services and for counseling minors. What it's saying is, whatever you're doing, let's just say you're going to do theophosphate. You need to explain theophosphate to them make sure they want to do theophosphate. You don't just do things and give them, allow them to give you informed consent. Consent to use spiritual interventions. Special consent for controversial in interventions such as deprogramming, hypnosis. A lot of Christians don't believe in hypnosis. See what I'm saying? So if you're going to use hypnosis, which we don't here, we don't believe in it here, but if you would be doing that, you need to get informed consent. Adversive therapies, recovery of memories, counseling abortion or abuse, risks, and give alternatives. Confidentiality, privacy, and privileged communication. Hold confidential to the full extent of the law, ethics, and church rules, except with written consent. So we have more than just the standard laws, don't we? Any church rules in your church, any uh, ethical rules, and of course the fullest extent of the law. One of the things we have to realize here is that unless you're licensed by the state, you probably don't have privileged communication. What's privileged communication? That in the law, you don't, you don't have to testify in the law about something. You're like a lawyer. 
Uh, most states only grant that if you're licensed by the state. So as a Christian counselor, you probably don't have that. You need to maintain confidentiality, but if they call you to court, you're going to have to say whatever happened in that counseling session because you're not licensed. Assert confidentiality first to subpoenas and requests and only comply to the limit of the law or a release or a given time for the client to consult a lawyer. They're saying the situation is this. If you get a subpoena, you don't just say, here are the records. You say, no, I believe I have confidential in this particular area unless you get a court order ordering me to give this information or you get a release from this client for this particular information, I'm not going to give it to you. But once you get that court order, then you're going to have to do it. In most, like if you're called to testify, what's probably going to happen is that they're going to, uh, you know, you take the witness stand and you say, uh, uh, Sir, I just want to assert that I have proof of communication in this particular case. And the judge says, testify. Now it's on the judge, it's not on me. You see what I'm saying? Now we haven't breached confidentiality. In this particular case, you just have to realize that that can happen, but you don't just automatically give records if you get a subpoena or something like that. Disclose as necessary to prevent and report suicide, homicide, or child or elder abuse, or to warn the victim according to Tarasoft rules if they apply in your state. They do apply in Kansas, and therefore, uh, that would be the case. We talked about this in the last session, if you remember. Basically, you have to report homicide, suicide. You have to uh, take to a higher authority. You have to warn the victim. And also, in, you have to report child and elder abuse. Disclose to insurance according to the agreements with the client. This is really sticky because the insurance companies have some sort of an agreement where they can get your records to verify on the insurance. Well, how much is that? Well, they think it's everything. Some clients don't like this idea, but most insurance contracts that they sign have some sort of a waiver or something in there. And you have to sort of figure that out. So they normally do get all your records if that's what they ask for. Disclose in supervision, training, and publication uh, by disguising clients' identities or get a written permission. In our informed consent here, they already give that consent when we start counseling with them, that we can talk about their particular cases by name if necessary in supervision. Preserve, store in a locked storage, and transfer to maintain confidentiality of clients' records. Take appropriate actions like password protection to protect confidentiality. Those are all the things that we have to do. Now, under HIPAA, if you happen to do electronic transmissions, which requires you to do HIPAA, there are a whole lot more legal requirements in the area of confidentiality. However, if you only use mail, fax, and uh, telephone in your counseling and transferring of records, then you're not under HIPAA, and you don't come under that whole another set of rules that have been passed about electronic transformation of information. You can still even keep it on your computer, you just can't transmit it over the internet or transmit it uh, electronically. Fees and financial arrangements. Set fees fairly and clearly attempt to take the client's ability to pay into account. Sliding scale or pro bono is encouraged, but they must be extended in special agreements, any special agreements to third party payers. This is one of those catches. What the insurance companies say is, you're being unethical. If you charge us one amount, and you charge somebody because they don't have insurance a different amount, and we have that problem all the time. Because I do take insurance, that's why I have a set fee, and I'm not on a sliding scale, because if I was on a sliding scale, I would have to give the sliding scale to the insurance company. You see the problem? I don't necessarily agree with that one, but that's in the code. Uh, case notes and proper record keeping shall follow legal and appropriate practices, which, by the way, are not defined. All it says is you have to keep adequate records, and who knows what adequate is, and will be maintained by the organization and follow the client rather than the therapist. What does that mean? It means if you're working here and you go someplace else, we keep the client records. So the person can find them. 
Otherwise, what do I have to do? Chase their therapist all over the world trying to find where their records went. Appropriate testing will be used within the limits of competency and validity. If you're not qualified to give the test, don't use it. Remain fair and unbiased in group and family counseling. This is the deal of not taking sides, right? Okay? And we'll protect clients in these settings from abuse. If you're in a group and the group is jumping on someone and tearing them up, what's your responsibility? Protect them. Work with other faiths, religions, or values to the extent possible with respect for their values and refer if the differences are adversely affecting the counseling and cannot be resolved. Now, does that say you can't talk about your Christianity? No, it doesn't say that. It just says you're willing to talk about it, that you're not under restrictions under this code of ethics that you are under others where you're not supposed to talk about those things unless the client wants to talk about those things. Provide emergency services and continuing continuity of care during a vacation or counselor transfer. So that means if we have a counselor that quits here or transfers or goes someplace else, we need to transfer them or offer them to either refer someplace else or transfer them uh, someplace else. And if they get sent to a hospital and so on, we try to keep continuity of care. Once they come out of the hospital, fine, we'll try and help them. We'll, re we'll talk to the people they're dealing with in the hospital and so on. Do not abandon or abruptly cut off services, but discuss and refer if appropriate. You don't just come in one day, you know what? You're a pain. I quit. And I say, I don't think things are working out here. I'll tell you what, I think we'd be better off to find you another counselor. Uh, I've got some suggestions. Uh, you can go here or there or there. We'll set it up for you if you would like, but we're not going to abandon you. Professional relationships. Maintain collaborative relationships and respect different approaches. How many different approaches are there in counseling? All of them. All over the place. All different ideas. All different things. And from a secular point of view, they're all ethical just so you're doing, you're trying not to do harm, you're trying to help your client. Do we, do we agree with some of this? Well, no. But we would still try to work with these people to the degree that we can possibly work with them without violating our own values. Do not solicit others' clients. If the client is receiving other counseling, uh, you need to inform the other counselor and work out something because the other counselor may not know or find out if the person is telling them that you're seeing two counselors at a time. Some particular counseling agencies, because it can confuse the client, don't want the person counseling with two different people. We don't have that problem here if we have clear boundary lines. In other words, if I'm doing the marriage and family counseling and Rose is doing the drug alcohol counseling for the clients and somebody else is doing theophostic counseling, we don't have a problem just so there are clear lines as to what each counselor is doing to help this person. Some other counselors don't want that. And so you need to have the client say, <laughs> just ask the counselor if this is okay with them that they're seeing you and me or do they want it to be an exclusive thing and then we'll have to work this out. Honor contracts and have clear boundary roles in the workplace. Do not discriminate in hiring. Do not take clients with you if you move. This is a big thing. Let's say you're working here at Word of Life and you are going to decide we're going to start your own agency across town. Unless we agree, you're not supposed to take all your clients with you. Uh, see, because what can you do? Come here, build up your client load, and start your own place across town, and take all your clients with you. See, is that fair? Who did the advertising? Who got the clients to come here? We gave you the clients, so the clients stay here unless we agree. In most cases, we'll agree that you can take the clients with you. But those are, that has to be worked out. Advertising public relations. Accuracy and humility to give clients informed choices not using testimonies of current clients or degrading other counselors. This is sort of like judges, you know, they're not supposed to argue about the different cases and so on when they, if they do any advertising or they're getting votes. It's the same kind of thing. We don't want to have battles between counselors. We don't say, oh, I wouldn't go see him. They're just an absolute disaster. They don't know what they're doing. We don't do that kind of thing. 
and you say they might have different points of view on this particular subject, and you have to choose who you would like to see. Not misrepresent AACC membership or counseling credentials not implying state licensure or regional accreditation when it does not exist. A lot of people, and one of the real conflicts they've had in AACC is over people that use the term licensure, like I am a licensed pastoral counselor. Well, there is no such thing as a state licensed pastoral counselor, do you understand? But they have some organization that says, if you do these things and meet our requirements, we license you. And they say, don't do that. Don't get the terms. State licensure or regional accreditation, if you have a degree and it's not regionally accredited, like our degrees here, don't go say you have a regionally accredited degree. Say you have a Bible college degree. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yes, Logos has accreditation, but not regional accreditation. So don't go and say that wrong to make yourself look different than what you really are or what your degree is to be different. If they don't ask, it's no problem. Correctly represent our work in the media. That you don't go and say stuff in the media that's going to look bad or anything like that. Relations with state social services uh, systems and society. Maintain good relations with other types of counselors or systems. In other words, you don't go bad mouth SRX. How many people that come to you that are struggling with that are going to have problems? Well, you help them try and see that the SRS is probably overloaded and they're probably trying to help you the best they can. But yes, we realize they do have problems and struggle, but we're not going to bad enough. Mm -hmm. Work for the, the betterment of the church, the government, and the society. This is all Bible-based stuff. Accept different views of, uh, on Christian participation in society. Some people believe we shouldn't be involved, and some people feel you should be really involved in every election, right? Mm -hmm. And saying, well, recognize these different views. We're not going to get into that stuff. Let's just stay focused on counseling, okay? Mm -hmm. Supervisors, educators, research, and writers. Uh, you're going to do it with excellence. Do not exploit students, especially. Sexual, romantic, dual relationships, and do not counsel beyond uh, what is needed for supervision and training. Acknowledge students' contributions. In other words, if we're in a class here and so on, and I have you all write a paper, and I put all those papers together into a book and publish it, do you think I would give you credit? That's what they're saying. You need to give credit to who credit is due for all the different kinds of stuff, especially in teaching, which we'll see. Uh, in supervision, we need to do that to help uh, other people, except only qualified candidates with informed consent. Provide varied experiences. Uh, provide feedback to your students. Educators, accept qualified students with informed consent with diverse backgrounds. Provide evaluations and assistance to correct deficiencies. You don't just let them keep doing what they're doing. Our job is, if you can't write, to help you learn how to write. If you don't know what you're doing in your counseling, to help you do that. Include both academic classes and practical experience, including diverse theories, including legal, ethical, and business respects. We try and are educating to provide you all the different aspects that you need. Clear guidelines for practicums and internships. We have that. Researchers, respect science and research standards. Protect participants' rights and minimize effects on participants. Use informed consent and provide confidentiality. Report research honestly, fully, and without distorting data. A lot of this stuff is basic. I'm sure they got this even from other codes. It isn't different for Christian, but we want to point out especially the differences from a Christian standpoint here. Writing. Give credit and honor copyrights. Honor publishing agreements. Resist using ghostwriters and do not put your name on others' works without giving them credit. There are a lot of situations right now in the uh, industry of publishing that in order to publish anything, you have to have a big name on it. So what happens? A lot of the big names take a lot of people who have good works that they can't get published and will stick their name on it. We'll say their name first and then somebody else's name. Do you see what I'm saying? But the truth is, this guy wrote almost the entire thing and they had one chapter. And they're just saying, don't do that. You need to be careful and give adequate credit to who did what 
uh, in a particular document or something. Exemptions for ordained pastors and pastoral counselors. Now this is a big thing. What is this all about? We realize the standards we just gave you are a lot like secular counselor standards, aren't they? Well, is that going to work very well in the church? Probably not. So in other words, we're going to give some exemptions now to people that are either pastors, ministers in the church, or pastoral counselors. Those are just counselors in the church that are also a pastor. Although I'm a clinical marriage and family therapist by license, I would still be considered a pastoral counselor because I'm a pastor and I'm a counselor, right? So all these exemptions might apply to me, okay? Again, we'd have to justify that. The first is, uh, we do, what is a pastoral counselor? A pastor who counsels. Pretty simple. Must be justified due to a higher duty to the church or position. So anything exemptions I want to take to the rest of the stuff we just read up till now, I have to justify because either it violates what would make me do, it violate what God tells me to do, or violate what the church tells me to do, or violate my position. Okay? Should hold counselors in fidelity to the gospel. One of my jobs would be, if we have a counselor here, like we did at one time, and I told someone they should get a divorce, what do I have to do? Sit them down and talk to them and say, I don't think we can, unless they have grounds, I don't think we can uh, give that kind of advice. In fact, the Bible says that God hates divorce and that he wants us to do everything we can do to fix it. So we need to rein you in here a little bit and as long as he worked for us, you can't do that. That'd be one of my jobs as a pastoral counselor here. Lay helpers and other ministries. Primarily, it's a one-to-one -one or support group, so it's where we see this lay counseling type of things. But there are some exemptions. What would be some of the exemptions? One of them is that they don't have as much training as other people. Another one might be we require them to be under supervision. Do you see that? Here are some exemptions. Honor code, except due to a higher duty to church or position. They're under the pastor of that church. Under supervision to the church or a Christian counselor. Do not accept fees. Communicate false roles and refer if not qualified in certain areas. But that doesn't mean they can't operate. It doesn't mean they, normally a regular counselor, we're gonna require liability insurance, right? No, with them, we'll cover them on our insurance insurance. And we're not expecting them to be able to do a lot of things and to know a lot of the stuff that we just covered. But under supervision, we'll teach them that. So there are people that don't have as much training, so there's an exemption there. Standards and resolution of of ethical and legal conflicts. What are the standards? The higher obligation to Christ or to the good of the client worked out in ways that honors Christ first attempting to harmonize the interests. Let's just take an example. Let's say that you are working with a particular client and that particular client uh, has another counselor and that counselor uh, because they're struggling with homosexuality, suggests that, uh, that, that the client might try homosexuality to see if they like it. What am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to take a stand and say, I'm sorry, I believe that that's wrong and the other counselor is wrong. Would that be correct according to the code up to this point? Really wouldn't be, would it? But because of Christ and what the Bible says, in my particular stance, I would take that stance anyway. And under this ethical code, I would be right to do that. If it stands against the law or the ethical principle, it must be defensible from the Bible and ethics with consultation with others uh, in the best interest of the client and willing to accept consequences. What's this particular addressing? Abortion clinics? People taking a stand and uh, violating the law in the area of the laws on abortion or euthanasia or other things like that. That we in this code of ethics are responsible first to Christ before we're responsible to the government. Do you see that? 
And so according to this code of ethics, it would be ethical to do a sit-in at an abortion plant. It would be ethical to help people not have abortions. Even if there was a code of ethics that said that you could not help people out of homosexuality, according to this code of ethics, we would help them out of homosexuality anyway. You see what it's saying? It's saying the values of Christ supersede all these other ethical codes because you understand, like I'm a member of the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy. If they're ethical code, there have been struggles in that organization for a while to put in the ethical code that you can't help people out of homosexuality. Well, even I'm under that ethical code, what does this ethical code say? No, I go by the higher value and the value to the client as I see it. So I can violate other ethical codes, if necessary, for Christ. That's what this is saying here. Priority values must first be to Christ, then the client, and then to the standards. Or you need to define the rule that cannot be accepted and accept all others. Just because we have a right to violate this one particular rule doesn't mean we throw everything out in that particular area. Like we throw all state laws out because I have to violate this one particular state law based on this rule of ethics. Conflict with employees and colleagues. We do it in a way that honors Christ and the best interests of the client. Christianity in the secular workplace includes serving Christian clients from a Christian basis. You hear what it's saying? What's this all about? This is about you are a counselor and you're working for a secular agency. Are you going to just keep your mouth quiet and never say anything about Christ or what are you going to say and how are you going to handle that? First it's saying that if you have a Christian client and they want you to counsel them from a Christian point of view, you have a perfect right to do that. Sharing values as a part of self-disclosure. It's okay in a secular agency for you to say, you know what, I understand where you're coming from. I'm coming from a Christian background. I just want to let you know that I'm a Christian and that I don't believe that abortion is right. That's self-disclosure. Responding to spiritual needs expressed by the clients. If the client says, would you help me deal with forgiveness? Would you help me deal with these? You have a perfect right in a secular agency. Realize there's some legal hassles over this kind of stuff. Uh, normally we win that by the Constitution and so on. But you as a Christian counselor in those kind of agencies have that right by this ethical code. Displaying Christian symbols in literature. One particular school that I know of is required that all teachers do not have the Bible on their desk anymore. And that isn't valid, you, by, according to this code of ethics, you can challenge that kind of Use negotiations, medi mediation, ar and arbitration before you use litigation. Well, if you don't go to law on these issues, you try to work them all out with the people involved, realizing that in Christian counseling, we're going to have some of these struggles, some of these conflicts. And this ethical code does not say back off from those because you have a higher call to see people saved. You have a higher call to uh, declare the standards that God has than you have to your secular agency or to the law or to other things. So you see how this code is significantly different in this area to the rest of the ethical codes. Confront legal and ethical violations by colleagues confidentially and through appropriate channels. And then if you have to, you go on to legal. Professional and organizational conflicts. Honor professional obligations and ethics unless they are in direct opposition to God. And some of them are. As an example, if you're a member of the American Psychological Association and they say you can't help people that are homosexuals, what do you say? Sorry, I'm going to do it anyway. According to my ethical code. And this is my ethical code. Conflicts with state and its laws. You may violate the law if it's in direct opposition to God. Those are your AACC ethical codes. In sort of a nutshell and sort of really fast. You see, we're dealing with it. Now let's go and take a look again at the ethical code that we have here as Bible-based coaches. Because this course is for both for coaches and for counselors. And you're going to see a lot of these same things in this very short ethical code that we have for Bible-based coaches. As we said, 
there are no laws about coaching at this particular point of time. And so these are just what we have put together here that puts together what we think those ethical codes are. And if you're going to coach for us, we require you to have uh, that information and we require you to sign it. So we, if you're going to work for us, we expect you to follow at least these basics of coaching ethics. Number one, I will exemplify Jesus Christ in all my life and my conduct as a coach seeking only the best interest of my clients and to further the kingdom of God. What's this? Do no harm, right? But we've been saying more than that. No, in the interest of God. I will maintain strict confidentiality within my coaching relationship except as required by law and for coaching supervision unless released by my client. I will clearly explain that coaching assists emotionally healthy individuals to more fully achieve their calling or ministry, where counseling primarily assists people in overcoming besetting sins, dysfunctional behavior, and relationship problems. I will be careful not to allow my coaching to be used as a substitute for counseling, legal, mental, or physical treatment. If I am not qualified, I will refer issues to a lawyer or mental health practitioner pastor or doctor when appropriate. I will do my best to help my client achieve success in his or her life from a biblical perspective. However, I will never attempt to override my client's rights to make their own choices and learn from their own consequences or direct their own lives unless they become a danger to themselves and others. Do you see how this is just sort of outlining very briefly uh, some of the stuff we talked about counseling only we make it very specific just for the coaching relationship. I will give literary credit for any materials that I have adapted or referenced for my use. I will avoid dual relationships with my clients that might result in conflict of interest or might interfere with the coaching relationship. Did that say I will avoid all dual relationships? It only said in this particular case that you'll avoid those that will have a detrimental effect. Because we realize in coaching, having a personal relationship with the person is very effective, isn't it? In truth, that really is a dual relationship, though. Because what? The whole coaching relationship, if it's still a coaching relationship, and you're going out to have coffee with them, and you go over to their house and so on, and you're doing coaching, that's still part of your coaching relationship. So dual relationships in coaching is much less restrictive than it is in the area of counseling. If such a conflict of interest exists, I will openly discuss it with my client and offer to refer him or her to another coach if desired. I will recognize pastoral leadership within the church environment and I always conduct my coaching in submission to that leadership. I'm not going to start moving people in the church a different direction than that pastor is taking them. Remember, he is the shepherd, I am the sheepdog, right? So if I'm the sheepdog, what should I do? Should I follow the shepherd's lead, or should I get the sheep all going the opposite direction? Obviously, we get the sheep going the same direction, and hopefully that pasture is following Christ. So then we have all the sheep going in the right direction. I would develop, agree upon in writing, and honor the provisions of a clear coaching agreement with my clients. If I charge fees, those fees will be clearly explained to that client. I will accurately identify my qualifications, training, and experience as a coach. I will not knowingly exploit my coaching relationship for personal, professional, or social purposes. I will live my life in obedience to Jesus Christ, admit my mistakes, repent if I am wrong, be open and honest concerning my own present and past struggles, and live as a Christian example to those that I coach. That's critical because in coaching, your example says a lot more than your words do. And you're leading them where you have already gone. That's sort of the whole idea. So what have we done in this course? We've gone and we start everything. We start with attending skills. And we talked about listening skills. And we talked about uh, how to paraphrase. We talked about how to connect. We talked about how to analyze the problem. We then integrated all of that. Now we've looked at ethics and what ethics is all about. So what we hope to have done at this point is provided you 
a more in-depth look at all those different skills you need so that now, with the exception of counseling theory and all the information that you need, you have the skills necessary to go out and start counseling and to start coaching. At least you have the basic skills to build upon at this particular point. And that's what this course is all about. That's right. Lord, we thank you that you are the one in charge. And we ask, Lord, that you would guide us and direct us and help to hear, stay here from your Holy Spirit, to know and be directed by you. We ask that you would help our skills and put an anointing on them, Lord God, and integrate them together, Lord God, that we might become effective counselors or coaches in your kingdom to help people, Lord, become all that you want them to be. And we'll give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Cause Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer.